This is problem 16.86, it's on page 747. And unfortunately, the figure does not match, so we'll have to go by the description. Also, the description doesn't give us one piece of vital information, so I've made an assumption that matches an older version of the text, and I think we'll, uh, we'll work. Okay, so the rim of the flywheel has a mass of 1,800 kilograms and a mean radius of uh, 0.6 meters or 600 millimeters. As the flywheel rotates at a constant angular velocity of 360 RPM, radial forces are exerted on the rim by the spokes and internal forces are developed within the rim. Neglecting the weight of the spokes determine A, the internal forces in the rim, assuming the radial forces exerted by the spokes to be zero, and then B, the radial force exerted by each spoke, assuming the tangential forces in the rim to be zero. What on earth are they talking about? Well, I'll show you. So here's our wheel. And the thing they didn't tell us was how many spokes. I'm going to assume eight. One thing it's easy to draw for another thing. That's what was uh, given in an older version of the text. They said that the mass of this wheel is 1,800 kilograms. And we're, we're supposed to assume that the spokes are, don't have any mass and that all the mass is concentrated in this outer uh, rim. Which, by the way, the radius of that outer rim is 600 millimeters or 0.6 meters. The angular speed, now let's put that down here. The angular speed was given as 360 revolutions per minute. I don't like that. I would rather have radians per second, so I converted it, and I got about 37.7 radians per second for the angular speed. And what we're supposed to do is find the force in the rim if the force in the spokes were zero. In other words, what if the spokes just weren't there? And then we're supposed to find the force in the spokes if the force in the rim is zero. That's as if the rim were, the, the rim had no strength. So let's see, let's start off with a free body diagram. And we'll begin with question A. Now, if I take a section of the rim, there will be force in the rim holding it to the other section of the rim, right? I'm trying to make this larger than 180 degrees. There will be equal and opposite forces, in other words. And this force is the force that I want. Basically what I've done is I've taken the wheel and taken a free body, just imagining a cut. Now, if I select this cut cleverly, I can make my life easier. Because right now, if I cut here, well, then the direction of the forces are tangent, and they don't point the same direction, and that's a little bit of a thing. What if I were to cut the wheel in half? What if I were to consider half of the rim? Well, then the forces in the rim point nicely in the same direction. And, of course, there's no reason to suspect that I would get anything different by choosing any angle. So these two forces would be symmetrical. They would be equal to each other. Now this free body diagram is equivalent to a kinetic diagram. It says, well, the wheel, or this half of a wheel, you can draw that a little better, I need a semicircle. Has a center of gravity somewhere? Where is it? Well, it's not here. Imagine taking a bike wheel and cutting it in half and trying to balance the rim back along this line. That's not going to happen. In fact, the center of gravity, if you look at the front of your book, there are some area properties. For a thin rim like this, it says that the center of gravity, let me call it CG, is at a position, now the center of the wheels right here, is at a position of 2r over pi. That's the distance. Given the radius r, that's the location of the center of gravity. Okay, so let me uh, actually put it over here. Let me put the CG over here. And I guess I'll put my dimension over here instead. 2r over pi. And that way I've got some space over here because I want to draw some other things. In particular, I want to draw the dynamic forces which have to act through the center of gravity. So that would be the mass of just this half of the rim. So um, 
I'll use, uh, let me do this. Let's, since we've already used M, let me write M over 2, acceleration in the x direction, and M over 2, acceleration in the y direction. Again, assuming a usual x, y coordinate system. Okay, so these forces have to cause these accelerations. Now, notice that this x direction acceleration is a tangential type of thing, right? And the only way we can have a tangential acceleration is if the wheel speeds up. But the wheel's moving at constant speed. As a matter of fact, the angular acceleration is zero because the angular speed is constant. So that means that this is not even there. There is no MAX. Okay? There's only this term. As a matter of fact, I have assumed the wrong direction because look, this center of gravity is accelerating towards the center as the wheel rotates around. Uh, it doesn't matter that I've uh, assumed the wrong direction. It's a plus minus sort of thing. All that matters is that I can figure out the normal acceleration of it. And I can, right? As a matter of fact, um, let me do something. Let's make our lives a little easier. Let's change the direction of y. And in that case, I can change this direction. That way it will match the proper direction of the normal acceleration. So this will be m over 2. A y. And now, the normal acceleration of the center of gravity would be equal to the angular speed divided by r. But r is not this radius. r is the distance from here to here. Well, let me call it rho instead. Uh, let's see. Let's just put it here, I guess. Bad practice. It's on top of the body, but that's okay. So omega squared times rho would be the normal acceleration, which is just equal to a y. Okay, so now what? Well, now that I understand uh, the kinematics, now let's study the kinetics, the causes of the motion. So we'll start off by summing forces in the y direction. It seems to be the most logical direction to go. And let's see. Now the forces on the rim, there's two of them. They both point in the positive y direction. And then that's equal to, uh, let's see, the mass times acceleration. So that's m over 2. But instead of using a y, I will use omega squared rho. Now, of course, rho is 2r over pi. So 2r over pi. The twos cancel. And we have m omega squared r over pi. So the force in the rim is equal to, let's see, what have we got left? The mass from here, omega squared from here, r from there over, now notice we've got a 2, we've got to move to the other side. This is going to end up in the denominator, so 2 pi. So m omega squared r over 2 pi. So plugging in the numbers, the rim force would be equal to 1,800 kilograms multiplied by omega 37.7 radians per second. All of this is squared, of course. R is actually 0 0.6 meters, or 600 millimeters, divided by 2 pi. Plug all of that into your calculator, and you will find that the force on the room is, well, let's see, what will the units be? Well, radians go away for free. We have kilograms, meters per second squared. Those are newtons. And so this is 244,290 newtons, or about 244.3 kilonewtons. There's the force in the room, rim for part A when the spokes aren't offering any structural integrity. So we're taking care of question A. What about question B, where the spokes take all of the load rather than the rim taking any of the load? Well, then we need a different free body, right? Because then the spokes are uh, uh, adding to this. We need to figure out the, the force in the spokes. We need a drawing of the spoke. We need to include it. Well, if I were to draw the whole thing, I'd end up with a wheel like this. But that's not very useful. What if I were to take a segment of this? In other words, basically, if I think about it this way, this spoke supports a section of the rim. In fact, it supports an eighth of the rim. 
another way to look at this is that an eighth of a rim, let me draw it. Here's my eighth of a rim. Is trying to fly away. In other words, it's trying to move on a straight line. But this spoke has to apply a force to this segment of mass in order to keep that segment of mass of the rim accelerating normally in this direction, you see. So if I'm taking an eighth of the wheel, then the total angle, uh, let's see, for an eighth, well, let's see, what would, we, what would we have? Well, if you look at the geometry, we're going to end up needing geometry for this little arc. If you look at it, there's an equation that uh, it's in front of your book in the area of properties. Uh, it's on the left-hand side of the bottom. And it defines the half angle alpha. So we're going to need alpha. That's, that's this angle right here. But then the location of the center of mass, that from here to here, that distance will be alpha, no, no, I'm sorry, it's r sine alpha over alpha. And kind of a weird equation, you may not be used to seeing this. Where you've got the variable in the sine, the variable in the bottom of the equation. So, if I could just get that angle, I'd be okay. Well, how many, how many, uh, and by the way, one thing to note, this angle alpha has to be in radians. Obviously, you can set your calculator in radians or degrees, it won't matter as long as you do it right. Take the sign of it and be done. But this alpha here has to be in radians, so be really careful about that. You can't make that degrees and this make any sense. So, how will we do this? Well, it's pretty easy. How many radians are in a circle? Well, one way of saying is that there are two pi radians per revolution. A revolution is a whole circle. So there are two pi radians. So I need a sixteenth of that, right? Because I'm taking an eighth total. So alpha would be two pi by sixteen. So that's just pi over eight. It's an eighth of pi, right? That's alpha. Okay, so now I've got the angle. That's all well and good. So now I've got the location of the center of gravity of that little bit. And I need a kinetic guy. Oh, I, have I drawn everything? Uh, yeah, that's it. There's no force in the spoke. Remember, we assume that's zero. I'm sorry, no force in the rim. We assume that's zero. But there's only force in the spoke. And that's the only force acting on the rim. So, so that's it. And by the way, this is one-eighth of the rim. The kinetic diagram. <coughs> Here's that center of gravity. Well, let's see. We've got... Uh, Mass, acceleration in the x direction, mass, acceleration in the y direction. As before, there must not be any ax, because notice that this body is not angularly accelerating, it's rotating at constant speed. And of course, ay is going to be the normal acceleration. Now, the center of the wheel is somewhere about there, right? Just like it is over here. If I want to calculate the normal acceleration, It'd be omega squared times a distance. What distance? The distance between the center of mass and the center of rotation. Well, that distance, I could give it some other term as before, but it's simply this, isn't it? It's just r sine alpha over alpha. So there's the normal acceleration. Now that I've taken care of the kinematics, I can sum forces in the y direction again. I'll get the force in a spoke, which is what I want. That's the only force uh, applied to this eighth of a rim. And it's equal to the mass. What mass? Now, I've written mass here, but I've already defined mass as the total mass, so that wasn't very good. This is really just an eighth of the mass, isn't it? So the eighth of the mass times normal acceleration, well, that's omega squared r sine alpha over alpha. So now all I have to do is plug in numbers, and we should have a result. The mass is 1,800 kilograms. It needs to be divided by 8. Angular speed, 37.7 radians per second. Quantity squared, that's omega squared. R is 0 0.6 meters. And then I need sine of 
pi over 8 divided by pi over 8. Plug all that in your calculator, and you'll find that the force in the spoke is about 186,980 watt. Well, the radians go away for free, just like the 4 kilograms of meters per second squared, so newtons. So the force in the spokes, if the rim force is zero, the requirement is 186 uh, point, well, about 187.0 kilometers in order to hold this rim in place and, and keep the rim rotating and the, the, the segments accelerating towards the center of curvature, towards the center of rotation. Um, so it's just interesting to note that the spokes don't have to apply as much force as the, the rim segment has to apply in order to keep the segments all moving in a circle and the flywheel does not just fall apart. <laughs>